There's a lot to learn in Rust and it's quite complex, but you can get quite far without those more complex things like the borrow checker and lifetimes, just by working through something that you understand, working with the LSP, working with the compiler and figuring out the problems as you go. In this video, I'm gonna write a web scraper, something I know a lot about, to try to get myself further forward in the Rust language. Now, obviously I'm pretty new to Rust, so this is gonna be bad code. Heads up there, we're gonna use a lot of unwrap when we probably shouldn't, but but I think that's okay. The goal of this for me was to write a program that compiled and run and gave me the output that I was expecting. So I'm gonna talk you through what I did here and at the same time I'll talk you through a few things that I really liked about Rust as we got through and a few things that I found a little bit more challenging. So the first thing that I wanted to do is make sure I imported what I needed to and I decided that I was going to be using request and scraper which is going to pass the HTML for me. Now I'm only importing in scraper and error here because we're going to call request directly. I think at least that's what it means. I have my struct here which is defining the data that I'm pulling from the web and uh, with the derived debug it means that I can uh, print this out easier I think. So the first thing that I wanted to do was to create a get HTML function. And from here, what I wanted to do is pass in the client, the HTML client that I was gonna create. And this was a blocking client, which means not asynchronous. We wanna give the client into this URL and then take in, sorry, give the client to this function and the URL and then return some HTML from it. Now you can see here that I've got a lot of unwraps, et cetera, et cetera. But what we're actually doing is we, because we're using the client to send and then we want to unwrap the response and then we want to get the text from that response and then we want to unwrap the value from that. This is a lot of unwraps and this is definitely not the best way to handle this because if you don't know when you use unwrap, if it cannot get that value, it will panic and your program will stop. From here, I use the HTML pass document on the response, and then that returns that out from the function. In Rust, when you have the last line of your function that doesn't have a semicolon, it assumes that that is what you want to return from this function. So that was a good start. I can now get the HTML from a URL. I'm gonna be using that as we loop through the uh, pages of this uh, website later. The next thing I want to do is actually pass that data out. And we're going to be using a new function for this, where it takes in a reference. That's what the ampersand means, I think. A reference to the HTML that we're actually going to be taking in. We don't want to take ownership of this HTML because we're not going to change it in any way. We just want to have access to it. So I think this will work fine for us. From here, we're gonna return a vector of my product, which was the struct I created at the top. This vector is kind of like a list, I suppose, um, or a slice in Go. From here, we choose our selector. Now, this is basically the, uh, the selector for the main group of products what we're gonna be able to loop through. And again, I had to use unwrap on this, but I suppose if you don't find this, your program would need to stop anyway, because without this, you can't do anything. And then from here, we're saying, this is my section of product. This is my section of HTML that's got all these products in. So we can loop through it. And that's why we're using select at this product selector. From here, I'm creating a new vector, a new vec, with, uh, which is going to be mutable because we want to be able to add to this as we loop through. That's why the MUT, that's what that means. And we could do vec new to create that. Then we start our loop, which is for product in our product HTML. And we're saying that our name is going to be equal to the selector pass of H2. And then we unwrap the value out of that. From here, we then go to next. I couldn't remember exactly why I had to do this. It was in the documentation. I didn't fully understand this part. And then I had to do a map to collect the string against it. I certainly feel like my passing here isn't quite correct. However, it does work and I got the output I wanted. So I didn't mess with it anymore. I used unwrap or default here because there was a chance that I actually Maybe some of the products didn't have that information in that I was expecting. So I would either get the value I was wanting or I would get a default value to replace that, which meant the program would not panic. I did the same for the price and then I created a new version of my product struct with that information. This is essentially 
getting the information, passing it, and then sticking it into a dictionary or into a list of dictionaries for those who are uh, no Python. From here, I added it to my products vector and we were done with this function. <laughs> the next thing I had to do was just to return the product list, the product vector from it. And again, no semicolon, we just reference it. And because I had this as my output uh, selected within my function up here, you can see I'm saying we are returning a vector of my products and that's exactly what this is. We are good to, to go. The next thing I wanted to do was to work out how to get the next pages. This was a little bit more complicated for me because I had to do some kind of different error handling, which I'm gonna be honest, I didn't totally understand. I had to use this, I ended up using this box din error error, um, as well as the result types. It does work. Um, I'm not fully understanding how the result type works in Rust though. So that's something that I need to learn a little bit more about. You'll see how we return this in a minute when we use the okay. So again, here's a selector with a question mark at the end. I was When I was researching this, I found that I could probably use a question mark to handle the error for me. It's a shorthand way of doing it, I think, and this seemed to work just fine. And again, next page is my HTML. Select it, next, and I did okay or element not found. Again, I'm experimenting here. This is not like exactly how you're supposed to do things. This is just how I was doing it at the time. Again, remember the goal was to compile and run output exactly what I wanted. And again, the value here, I wanted the href attribute, unwrap again, and then I returned the value, which is a okay. So I believe this is the result value we're returning. And we're saying, if it's okay, we're gonna return this. Again, I'm not entirely sure that needs to be worked on, but we're getting there. The third part of my web scraping was gonna be, I wanted to save the data somewhere, I wanted to output it. So I decided that I would save it to a CSV file as well as putting it out to standard output. So I created a new function here that takes in my vector of my product and it will return an, a result of unit or an error. And that's because I'm not returning anything from this function, but I do wanna know that it worked. I think that's how that works or how I understood it. Creating a new path and I'm creating a CSV writer. This is very similar to Python. You create a, uh, you open your file in Python you do with open. And here I'm just creating my path and I'm actually opening it. I'm using unwrap and I think this is a good use of unwrap because if I can't open this file, I need the program to crash because it can't do anything without this file. But this is again, mutable. Then we write the record, the uh, name and price, which is the headers. And then we can loop through the data and write it to the file. Then we call flush on the file to clear up the memory, I believe. And then we have our okay here, which is just returning this unit. So I don't think anything's really coming back from this, but it does mean that I know that this function completed properly. Again, I had to do a lot of Googling to get this code and get this to work. So I could have lifted something which is bad practice, or I could have lifted something that uh, is unnecessary. But as I said, the goal was for it to work. Finally, we put everything together in our main function. Again, I wanted my, I needed my main function to return something. Um, and then we have our client, which we are using the client builder, which means we can add a user agent to every request, very similar to other languages. Dot build and with the question mark again, and I've created a start page of one because we're gonna be using that to input into the URL to loop through all the pages created a start URL. This is for my test site. You're welcome to use this for anything you need to test with web scraping. And now I'm creating a new vector to hold my products. Now I did this already, but what I'm gonna do is I'm actually going to, as I was uh, returning a vector of my product from my pass function, I didn't wanna end up with a list of lists. So I'm gonna loop through the vector and re-add it. This is not efficient, um, but in this case it worked for me. So I went with it. And I'm just printing out here to the uh, terminal what URL we are on using the format macro and the two uh, curly braces there. And then the value, then the um, start URL and start page that gets input into those to be printed to the screen. Create my loop. And then we'll say another again printing, we're requesting this page. And we're saying we're using our get HTML function. And then we're using our pass, punk, pass page function with a reference to that HTML. And then we're gonna loop through those products, printing them out, 
and adding them to our new results vector, which we can then actually deal with in our uh, CSV, our save to CSV file. And what I'm doing here is I'm saying if let. So I wanted to understand how to use match and if let, but I think if let was a better fit for here. So I'm saying that URL is going to be equal to if this exists, else I'm going to break out of this function out of this loop. So what I'm saying is that when we go to that page, if the next page, which is finding a selector, is OK, which means uh, it worked, then I'm going to return that value. If it doesn't, instead of doing unwrap where the function where this would then panic, I'm saying break. So we break out of this loop. What it means is when we get to the last page, there isn't any more pages, we break. Then I'm going to say let and save our results. I don't need a variable here, so I'm passing it with the underscore. And then I've got my OK with the unit in here like so. And that is it. So that was a lot to go through in one go like this, but I'm going to move over to my other terminal and I'm just going to show I do cargo run and we're going to rebuild and run and you'll see that all the products come through like so and we're on page uh, up to 12. And then I'm going to go back to my other uh, my other terminal here and products.csv. And there's the information that we pulled out. So a lot to unpack there. Um, first impressions were, I think I really liked it. I really liked the full control that you have to do this. You have to have the correct types. You have to be able to, you have to say what is exactly is coming out of your function. You have to use the error types. You can't use error you if you're returning a different error. It is quite tedious for those that aren't used to it, but I can see the benefits in the long run. I can see how with just some more understanding and some more changes that I could make this program a lot more robust, fail in the right places and fail properly with good errors to tell you why. And that's one of the things that I really miss in Python when I write code there is that I, there's a lot of places where it can fail and you're not exactly sure always why or where because of the use of try and accept. You put everything in a try and accept block, but which part failed and why it's a bit different. There's a lot to like about Rust. I really enjoyed writing it. I want to progress forward and I think I'm going to carry on. And I think that the next video I'm going to do will be more about more things, more things and programs that you can write in Rust without having deep knowledge of things like the borrow checker and lifetimes that I already talked about. So hopefully you've enjoyed this video. If you have, subscribe for more web scraping content, more data content, maybe some more Rust content. Who knows? Join the Discord. Come and tell me how bad this Rust code was. And if you're really good at it and you want to teach me, jump in and uh, come on and then let me know how, how I can improve my Rust code. I'd really appreciate that. So thank you very much for watching and I will see you again soon.